Welcome to the SpartanMag.com VCast. Jim Company, Paul Kunadike, Spartan Stadium, Michigan State, 52-0 to over Akron. Week number two, Michigan State 2-0, and getting ready to go to Washington next week for a chance to get to 3-0 and against what's going to be a difficult opponent next week, I think, much more difficult than what Washington was last year. But Michigan State today, a slow build type of blowout. It was 14-0, and Michigan State was getting stopped a little bit. Meanwhile, Akron was kind of stopping themselves with some of those turnovers. Some Michigan State forced them, but Michigan State got stronger as this one went along, especially after the quarterback Irons went out. Michigan State looks good on the scoreboard today, Paul. Well, I think Irons, you, you can say after he went out, and he was good early, but he was getting hit so much he wouldn't have been good for very long. We've seen that over a lot over the years of when you've got a good Michigan State physical to Michigan State defense. Irons was fresh early, but they were hanging him out to dry a lot with those quarterback draws. I think Michigan State was starting to come home, get home on a little bit. They started communicating a little bit. Early on, Michigan State was giving up a lot of yardage on those draws, but uh, you know, I thought you know Rico Cooney leaned over to me and said, I, I, "Who gets killed first, Irons or um, that uh, that crazy named receiver, Shocky Jacques Louis?" Yeah, sounds um, like a Cajun hit man. You know, and watching their game last week against St. Francis, I don't I don't remember them ever running quarterback draws, and they came out and did it three or four times in that opening drive, drove down into you know scoring territory, and ended up uh, Kendall Brooks with causing a fumble at the Michigan State twenty yard line. Right. At that point, if you'd have thought that Michigan State was going to shut them out, I would have been like, I ah, doesn't look favorable right now, especially after. Um, Irons moved them the second, I think the third time they had the ball, drove them a little bit. Uh, it's strange to see a, a game go 52-0, but early in the second quarter, the team that lost 52-0 had more yards. I mean, you'd have to go through a lot of college football to see games that ended up 50-plus to zero. But at any point when the team that ended up losing 50-plus to zero had was winning the yardage battle, so to speak, through you know, into the second quarter. That was just strange. I Turns out 600 to 200 yards, but it, it's strange. And it, and it turned when it was 14-0 when Irons went out. And it's a good point that uh, he might not have been able to go all 15 rounds. But it's interesting that Akron came into this game saying, you know what, we're going to we're gonna run the quarterback. We're going to expose him to these hits against Michigan State. And it worked for a little bit, but... Uh, what else are you going to do? And that's what Joe Moorhead has done in the past. He has run his quarterbacks, and they have gotten beaten up a little bit. Uh, I don't when, know. They, when they lost with McSorley here a couple of years ago, they I think they had upset Ohio State or came close to it, and McSorley ran the ball a lot and was great against Ohio State. Came in here, you know, after having taken a beating a little bit, right. Michigan State with Saquon Barkley, they they in those zone read plays, they, they went after Barkley and said, go ahead, McSorley, take it as right. much as you want. And that, that was a case where that, that was a very good Penn State team. But, yeah, you're right. He does lift, lay his quarterbacks out there a little bit. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things Michigan State did well in this one, you can talk about yardage all, all you want, but I think Michigan State did a much better job in this game of stopping the run than they did in the last in the last game. I mean, in terms of stopping the tailback runs. And they, they had a tailback. So they had the Minnesota transfer who's had some moments. He got the crap beat out of him today. Uh, I thought Michigan State, If you, you can say a lot about the level of opponent. A shutout's a shutout. But one of the things I didn't see a whole lot of today is I didn't see a whole lot of big yak plays where guys miss an tackle. Michigan State hit hard. They hit with a purpose. And there was minimal, uh, minimal gains after first contact. And that's what you want to see in week two. I thought Michigan State made some mistake, had some mistakes last last week, and uh, I think Michigan State did a really nice job, considering how many personnel was, was shuffling in and out. You, you, whether it's injuries on the defensive line, or bumps and bruises, you got different guys coming in. There's one time I was looking out there, and you got uh, you got Zion Young out there, and uh, Alex Van Summer on the inside, and and they're playing next to guys that usually don't play next to and I'm like well, what's going to happen here and they kept on making play after play after play a defensive back standpoint when the ball was in the air and there's a 50-50 ball there wasn't one time where uh, Michigan State's uh, defensive backs didn't win those uh, today and you know I think they had one spectacular interception by Chuck Brantley which I, I felt like should have st stayed because uh, that's the definition of uh, what happened there. Anyways, Michigan State still got the ball back, still did some things, but this is a really, really good performance by the defense. I can think of a lot of great defenses that have played out here over the years against a lot, even against not very good teams. And there's, in today's college football, there's not a lot of shutouts. Right. When, when they brought in the, the backup guy, the, what's his name, Undercuffler for the underdog, the Undercuffler? Undercuffler muffler. Yeah. Um, 
you know, he they fumbled that uh, that speed option, and then the the fumble with Cal Halliday. I mean, they just, he just was not at this level. Nothing against him, but he, I think he transferred in from Albany State or something, Division two, Division three. And there was the you know late in the game when he was thrown to the wide side of the field. They had play calls in there that he's just not capable of operating. That ball was just slow getting there. Brantley almost had an interception, and then later Michigan State arrived with a with a big hit to to knock it loose for 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 a pass breakup. Uh, once Irons went out, they didn't have a quarterback. They didn't have a run game, and they were one-dimensional. One-dimensional with a quarterback that can't deliver. The problem is, too, is the line. You've got times where you've got a defensive end and a defensive tackle uh, arriving at the at the ball at the same time. I, I don't care who your quarterback is. If you've got Jacob Slade in the middle or whomever is in the middle getting to the ball at the same time your defensive end is, bad things are going to happen. And yeah. that was a consistent consistent throughout the day with virtually four man pre- I mean with four man pressure I don't know how many times Michigan State blitzed uh, they, they under started five. To, yeah not many times and there was a blitz like late in the first quarter after Akron had had some possessions and it was it was it was becoming a thing a little bit um, then they blitzed once Michigan State did and had a positive outcome on a third down play and I'm like well that's an interesting uh, you know a little bit of a, a, a change there. You know, are they going to start blitzing more to see if they can handle it? Because initially, Irons had time to throw initially. And I, I was kind of shocked by that because Akron gave up more sacks than any team in the country last year. And they gave up seven sacks to St. Francis well, think about last it. week. I mean, you think about it, Jim. They've and Michigan 40, State. 44 Michigan. transfers. I mean. Uh, well, wait a minute. They, they gave up more sacks than anyone in the country last year. They gave up seven last week to St. Francis. Michigan State, with their pass rush last week, was really good. I was astonished that through about three or four possessions, Michigan State wasn't getting to the quarterback. So, um, in some ways, I thought Michigan State, was it was a sleepy start to this game. And... Um, the injury happened. It was 14-0 in Michigan State. Slow build. Blowout. Kendall Brooks. Um, it reminds me of Marcus Hyde. Remember when Marcus Hyde yeah. finally got he'd, – he'd was, he had like never gotten on the field with John L. Smith and D'Antonio kind of inherited him. And I think he got on the field due to someone else's injury. And he came on and was a hitter right away and, and became a starter and stayed a starter. I felt like with Marcus Hyde that there was a few, like, you know, I felt like Marcus Hyde's career was a slow build. You know, when he first got on for D'Antonio, there was like, okay, he did this, he hit really well here, but he would give up a play deep, and eventually he got he got really good over time. I, I don't know, like, Kendall Brooks has been, like, surprisingly solid, really solid through two weeks. He hasn't given up any big plays deep. He hasn't, you know, he was tested a couple times last week. The way he's hitting in space, uh, you know, those two forced fumbles were very, very, very impressive. I mean, that was like senior level, like Kyrie Willis coming downhill. He's a hard-hitting hard hitting. safety. He's hard-hitting safety. Legit. 215 pounds. Right. So, and the question is whether he can run. I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look at it again if, if Western specifically tested him. Um, I, I, I there felt, was one deep ball. I'm really? not sure. I'm not sure if that was the case or not, but I remember thinking – I haven't looked at everything close enough, but I come away still feeling that he's never had to really turn his hips and sprint with somebody like he's going to have to next week. And and if he can do that at 215, then you're like, wow. Um, that's something I didn't see. And one of my things I'm thinking about with, with Brooks is, you know, last year with Angelo Gross and Xavier Henderson playing every single down pretty much all season. And, you know, Tucker, you know, flat out said going to, going into spring practice, they didn't have enough trust in the second string safeties. And if that's true with Brooks – in that case, it's amazing how far he's come from last year. The other part of my brain is saying, you know, maybe he should have played last year. I, I'm, I'm astonished that he wasn't what? ready last year. He said to us tonight after a post-game press conference that he had a lot to learn, and now that he knows it better, he's a better player. But it's, it's still, I mean, Safety's he was second string last week, last year, and he played on special teams. But, man, that guy looks like – it's amazing that they kept him off the field last year. Yeah, but if he could, I don't. Played, I don't question it. If he it, could have played, he would have. You know, like I'm saying with, with as much issues as they had last year, we've seen all throughout this year. If a guy, if a guy makes a problem, a mistake as a defensive back, they'll pull him and put someone else in. There's no doubt in my mind that if he was capable of playing at this level last year, that he would have been on the field. There's, just, there's no question about that. So Vance Humeran started and Halliday started. Halliday had a, had a good uh, forced fumble and a fumble recovery and a return early in the game. Uh, 
so those linebackers feeling pretty good about themselves. You know, Brule played in the final minutes of the game, and he looks fast. Yeah. He just kind of jumps off with his speed. And th- they've got something to build with with him as well. What about individuals um, who, who, who impressed you today? Jalen Berger, over 100 yards, second straight week. Yeah, I think he was okay. He was okay. He, I, honestly, against this team, I expected both those guys to run, run well. If he doesn't have 100 yards against this team, if he's not averaging, I don't know what he averaged, 6.4 a carry or something, something yeah. like that. Uh, he had a couple, ripped off a couple long, long runs. Um, there was a couple times where I thought maybe he was going to bust at the distance. Then I realized that uh, they didn't have Jaden Reed out there blocking for him. There was a uh, one time I, I don't know. Uh, oh, it was uh, Jerron Glover. Glover was out there. He got a he got an okay block. He got uh-huh. like a passing grade on a block. But if it had been Jay, Jay Reed or uh, or someone else like that or Speedy Naylor last year, one of those things probably would have went the distance. I thought those guys did pretty well. I, Broussard kind of impressed me more than more than Berger because I kind of knew what Berger could do. Broussard in this one, I, with the exception of that fourth and one play, where uh, you know where he bounced it and he shouldn't have, he should have tucked it up inside. I feel like Broussard grew as a tailback today because he was tougher. And he had to be tougher. And I felt like they put him. In, I felt like they left him in there in goal line scenarios, where maybe in the past in his career he would have been pulled out for another tailback. But I felt like they left him in there for some short yardage situations, some goal line situations, where he just had to put his shoulder down, put his foot in the ground, and make some plays. And and he was able to do that. I think he grew. He grew today, a, as a result of that. And I think he learned some things. What did he say about that fourth down stoppage? What did he say about that? He said, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but he, he, said, he said live and learn. He said, I shouldn't have bounced it or something he like that. He right? didn't say I shouldn't have bounced it. Rico asked him a question about specifically, like, uh, maybe you shouldn't have bounced it. I think Rico's question, paraphrase, was, okay. uh, you know, you bounce it to the outside. In hindsight, you wish you had t- cut it back inside. And he, you know, basically said live and learn. I can't remember his exact wording on that. He didn't say he shouldn't have bounced it, but uh, he, said something he along acknowledged the- that maybe things weren't the way they, they – uh, should have been. I will say this. I don't. I can't remember him after that play. He had about eight or nine carries after that. I don't remember him bouncing outside one right. more time after that. I remember him cutting it inside yeah. uh, significantly, and that's that's growth from a, from a guy who's been a home run guy, a guy who's been a outside bouncer. Uh, for for him to to be well do well in this in this offense with this young developing offensive line, he's got to be able to get inside and hit it inside. It's good. And yeah, he said something along the lines of he should have just planted. He didn't, I don't know exact words, but planted his foot and gotten north. I think Tyler Hunt missed a block on that. And either Tucker or Thorne, when talking about the fourth down play, said someone came free and there was like a, um, it was Thorne that said this, but he didn't specifically say what it was. But I noticed that – I'll have to look at it again. But Thorne it like could have been covering for him a little, a little bit. Yeah, he's not going to come someone, out. I know that someone came free that shouldn't have. Yeah. But that ball should have gone inside. I'm pretty sure that it was Hunt that kind of missed missed the block, and Thorne's not going to say that. But uh, when that happens – so Broussard, uh, they got stopped on fourth and short there. So that that's something that they'll uh, – Tighten some screws on. That's the best thing that happened today for him from from an aspect of he got stopped there and then after that he was better. So that's what I like to see. You know, like, okay, that's what these games are good for. It's a learning experience. You get stopped, you're going to get stopped. You don't want to get, it's embarrassing to get stopped by these guys. But after that, he was marketably more, uh, you know, north and south, marketably more making cuts inside. He ran harder after that, and I think he learned a valuable lesson, and that's what you want to see in games like this. Before we go any further, uh, what color is this shirt? It's blue. Blue. It's kind of like a, like almost not quite Detroit Lions blue, but it's kind of that. It's, it's, it, not, it'll, it's not royal blue. It's more closer to Honolulu blue. Thank you. Because when it's on our website, you know what it's going to look like? Purple. Okay. <laughs> just um, wanted to point that out. Just just so I'm not going crazy. I'm glad your head's in the game there. Just so I, just so you know you, th- you know I'm not going crazy. Yeah, and this shirt's red. Uh, anyway, uh, Michigan State had a lot of. Uh, Players get involved. Malik Carr had a real big play. I think it might have been a third down play, uh, you know, an inside play that did that stiff arm and yards after catch. That that was a key play in the touchdown drive that I think put them up 14-0. Christian Fitzpatrick got some plays. Yeah. And there's, there were some things that they scripted for him. Um, they did like a little now route out to him formation of the boundary not very often did they put three receivers to the short side of the field when they were on one hash but when they got the ball to that hash they put that in there and went to him and uh, they they um, they they scripted some plays for Fitzpatrick so that's that's good for him to, to get into the party a little bit and with Jaden Reed going out for the second half Fitzpatrick played more Bernard played more but Fitzpatrick a part of it he's a good blocker um, they're not a team they're not a program that's like used more than four wide receivers a great deal but um getting him involved a little bit. Jaden Reed was lost uh, 
at the end of the first half. I didn't see what happened there, Paul. But yeah, I'm uh, not sure exactly sure. But when he he caught a, a tough pass on the sideline and he kind of got whipped down pretty hard. And when he came up, he did something like you know making a motion around like his helmet. I don't know what what that entailed. I don't know. It, I, it, I don't think he hit his head on, on the ground, but to me, I kind of felt like when he came off that it was a, I know he's had some lower body stuff and we've seen him even, even in that first half, uh, at times we've seen him limping around a little bit, but I felt like that was upper body, the way his, his body language was. Uh, he walked to the locker room with, uh, you know, with trainers. Uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means long-term. I was more, I was impressed with the versatility and the success that Michigan State had throughout the receiving core. And they put a lot of guys out there today. Uh, you know, you saw Cade McDonald out there as a punt returner. He he did some really nice things. I, I kind of would like to see, even though Jaden Reed, you know, what you didn't see right before right before he got hurt, he had a, a punt return for a touchdown that was called back. And he looked really good at that where he put his foot in the ground and went straight up the field. Something I like, you know, I like to see my punt returners do instead of trying to go outside, to, you know, trying to get to bounce it outside. That's the way you get hurt. Uh, he did a really nice job on that. Um, but, you know, McDonald did some good things. You saw um, Terrell Henry was out. He was out there a little bit. Uh, Jerron Glover was out there. There's, yeah, a lot Glover. Of guys, there's a lot of guys out there. Yeah, Henry and Glover are true freshmen. Henry's got on the field a little bit with special teams, but Glover had a reception on one play. Uh, I have to say that Glover's high school film didn't – thrill me all well, that much heard good things about him yeah you know like. and uh he's out there he made a play and on his reception interestingly thorn might have been kim no it was, it was hauser i think hauser was uh looking over here and bernard thought it was a run play he like <laughs> never turned around he was blocking 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 block. so he went over here to to glover so good job by hauser on that one completion i think that was hauser anyway but so hauser gets in the game before we talk about hauser noah kim gets in there it was big it was uh, big for him and for the program obviously you know thorn was hurt um kim comes in and they go they didn't hesitate went right to the air and his naked boot to trey mosley he looked like a starting quarterback on that play. Yeah, and I wondered about that play too because it looked to me that Keon Coleman ran the wrong, wrong, wrong route. I asked Noah Kim about that, and he is he acted like a starting quarterback in his response to me because he didn't want to embarrass anyone. He's like, "No, I think uh, they're both supposed to be over there. I think it was just because of the boot, and it was it was drawn out too long." Keon Coleman thought he was getting the ball, and then it was Trey Mosley underneath. I know Trey Mosley ran the right route, um, you know, so that's one of those things where it was nice. But I mean. That was a really well designed play, even though he and Coleman, in my opinion, probably screwed that up. Uh, but he looked good. He looked good last week with a um, you know with a nice ball that was that led to a pi. Uh, I think Michigan State can look at that, look at his body of work, look at his confidence. He did change a few plays at the line of scrimmage. I, I think his his knowledge of the playbook is is uh, significant and you can see he's comfortable within the offense he's comfortable get moving guys around when he has to he looks like a backup quarterback yeah. like you'd want a backup quarterback to look and that's that's a big development for michigan state especially this week when you look at the last two weeks peyton thorne's taking a couple big hits yeah and they, they've got to watch that um but he's taken some big hits and it's nice that michigan state has a veteran guy that knows the offense that is a team first dude that can come in and make plays and there's no doubt in my mind that he can run the team if he had to I agree, and it's amazing that Michigan State went the entire season last year without having to use Russo and really didn't blow anyone out so they could put him in there maybe once. And here in two games, the backup quarterback gets in there twice. And both times when Thorne came out, both times it's like, whoa, how serious is it? You know, Thorne knew himself that he was fine, but watching it from afar, it's like, well, you know, what's going to become of this? So so that's great with, with Noah Kim. Um, Peyton Thorne, two interceptions. Um, the deep pass to... Keon Coleman, do you think Coleman should have caught that one in the early going down the right sideline? He, he lay, laid it out a little a little too long, but it went through his fingertips. I think he should have got it. I'll, I'll tell you what, I think I think that was one where he was getting held a little bit too. And a veteran receiver, like a like a more like a guy that's been around for another year, would have found a way to get through that contact and get to the get to the ball. Um, you know, we're talking about elite like Keon Coleman being an elite athlete. If if you were running that route, there's no way. But Keon Coleman's Keon Coleman, right? Just yeah. like Jaden Reed's Jaden Reed. You, you know, 
you put ball up there, you expect those guys to get it. Uh, as good as Coleman's been, there have been a couple. There's been one play this week, one play last yeah, week. I, there would have been difficult catches, somewhat are, difficult catches, but you need those are experienced team. plays. You remember, like you remember back in the day when Benny Fowler, Tony Lippett, and those guys were close on some. They let some get off, get off their hands, and everyone's like, "What's wrong with these receivers? They're terrible." Yeah, Keith Mumphrey too. You know, that's an experience thing. When you get out there and you get in those situations, the more you run those plays, the more you have those thrown to you, the more often you're going to make make those plays. And even though Keon Coleman is a tremendous athlete, he has very little football experience, and he's gaining that. And uh, I think, you know, by the end of the season, um, you know, he's going to make a lot more than, uh, than miss. They're going to need him to gain that type of traction if this team is going to pursue some of the goals that they have in mind. They need number zero to be uh, closing those out. Meanwhile, Trey Mosley has had two really big, you know, you know, he's not – top of the rotation type receiver. You know, he's not the guy that everyone's got on the scouting report, but he's the guy that's making really good plays. Absolutely. And, uh, and that's what you want, too, a guy that knows his role and plays his role, and he's playing at a very high level. Um, he and, is. And then, you know, like I, I, Jeremy Barton, Bernard didn't have – he had some good plays this week, too. One of the things I think – we'll probably talk more about Peyton Thorne and what's his problem type of deal in a little bit. But one of the things I think that, that he did successfully this week um, is when they ran some of the underneath and intermediate stuff, he was pretty accurate on, on that. And uh, I, I think sometimes, I think sometimes he goes for the deep ball too much instead of taking what's there and go and getting the eight yards. I think when Michigan State had success throwing the ball and some of those the, some of those drives that ended up in rushing touchdowns, uh, some of those were set up by by 15, 20 yard passes as opposed to 40 yards. You know, like last year when they had last year when they had K nine. He had a lot of deep balls, but the Thor needs to go underneath and take what's what's there. And some, you know, like if it's an easy pass to the tight end, like that one pass he had to Malik Carr, wide open underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, late in the game, he had another one to Tyler Hunt, eight yards. Those things all add up and set up some bigger things later on. I feel like sometimes he tries to bite off too much. Yeah, and that one to Malik Carr was third down and ten. Malik Carr did a good job of sitting in the zone. And then, and then throwing, I think, short of the chains, believing that he might get some yards after catch. And it might not be there, but that, that's your best choice. That was a good choice, and that was, that was an important play when it went up 14-0. They had a new play today to Jaden Reed on the first drive. Uh, kind of, you know, it comes in motion, and they kind of flare it out to him. It's kind of like a speed flare type right. of thing. And that, that went for about 12 yards, got him down to the seven-yard line, and then five possessions later when they went up 21-0, they went back to that play on a second and five in the 29. So that was clearly on Michigan State's – um, red zone script and Jaden Reed is, is excellent That's, that was a new way to utilize him and uh, they have to hope that uh, they're going to have access to him uh, well, next week and in the weeks, a weeks ahead whatever was going on there Well, I don't know if it's like, I have no idea if, it, if it's upper body or whatever then he, he's got no control whether he comes back or not if it was like a con concussion and I'm not saying it was because I didn't we know, know yeah. I have no idea we but, were we were looking for him. Did, we, did he ever come out in the second half? I don't know if he I came on the know. field. I don't. I don't. I can't say for sure that he wasn't out there, but I can say I didn't see him. One thing is, you know, about Jaden Reed is if he can physically play or if he can walk, he's going to play. He's like one of those throwback old school receivers. You know, like whether you know, like a like a Musin Muhammad or you know, uh, those kind of guys, Derek Coleman kind of guy that's going to go out there and. Uh, what did you think about Thorne's drive before halftime? I thought it was just what he needed. I mean, that's what you want to see. I mean, he, he, he threw the ball well. I think we've seen this for a lot, a lot of years. Good quarterbacks, if they're struggling, you put them in the two-minute or short yardage situation or short or under two-minute, and uh, all they got to do is make a first down, and they, they, they settle down. And I thought, I think that's – that tells me – to me, that's evidence that, that this, this – issue or these issues that we're going to we talk about aren't going to last because I think you know he did some good things and and uh, I think he the two interceptions one I don't the flea flicker I think he just tried to do too much on that and then uh, the other one he, he said at the flea flicker he just wanted to put the ball up and let Keon make a play right. on it but uh, that was that was a first and ten he said afterwards he should just take a sack on that although they're they put emphasis on not taking sacks but um, the the, the gamble there, it's a, it's a blind it's gamble. Worth it. It's I mean, it, first it, and ten. Or is it? I mean, it, you could say that it's, your defense is playing like that. They're not going to score on your defense. But it wasn't really. 
I can he, see he's, it. he's angry with himself yeah, about it. But I can see if it's a 50-50 ball, it's a risk worth taking because you trust your receivers to make it. But if you're throwing it blind, is it a 50-50 ball? No, it's just like a it's like a, you know, it's like a backyard deal. That so if you don't know it's a 50-50 ball or you you know, you're throwing absolutely blind and you don't know and Keon like we talked about, he's still a young receiver. If that's Jay Reed or something like that, you know he's going to be there, and that's a 50-50 ball. I, yeah, and last year when the, flea, when the flea flickers worked last year, guys were wide open. On that situation, there were, there were a couple other times when they went flea flicker and it wasn't wide open and they had a check down. The run game's not as... This time, flea flicker and he had pressure, and he just kind of like threw, the a, run game he, is threw not, a prayer up. The run game is not sell out to stop the run. I mean, these guys showed progress, but it's not so... It's not dominant or so overwhelming that guys are going to, you know, be influenced by it. And uh, so I, I don't know if that's a good play right there. And then the second interception, uh, kind of some insightful quotes from Peyton Thorne on that. He said it wasn't the blitz they thought. That there, was a, there was a certain blitz they saw on film that they were prepared for, and Akron did a good job of showing what looked like it was that blitz right. but dropping a defensive lineman into his own blitz. And uh, – he had a defensive lineman dropping into coverage, and Thorne said that, that they worked on that blitz last night, and he threw the ball where they had game-planned it last night through the through the walk-through, the jog-through or whatever it was last night, and uh, there was a defensive lineman there. He said he should have taken a sack again on, on that one, but but I'm not sure that that was a thought process at that time because he didn't see the guy that was there. Instead of taking a sack, throw it away, right? I mean, like... It, if he sees that it's there, but but he, throw it, he threw it... In, just not expecting anyone to be there. So right. it's kind of like you have to throw not quite no-look passes like Matt Stafford or something yeah, like that, but those, you, you have to what? anticipate coverages and trust your film study that you know the opponent well enough that you could just like – you can just throw a, throw a blind dart there, but it didn't happen those today. Matt Stafford no-look passes are great until they aren't. You know, it all looks and I don't. I don't mean no look like he's. I'm, I mean you're no, throwing you're, you're throwing in the dark a little bit because you're like you know what the coverage is, you know what your route is, you know that that's open. Even though he's, it's not a no look, he's kind of thrown in the dark a little bit, which didn't it didn't work out on that one. So Peyton Thorne's not happy with himself, uh, inaccurate on a couple passes here and there. His quote was that he's got to he's got to stop missing people high. And he, he, his quote he was he he's pissed off about it. Yeah. So I thought that we would see Peyton Thorne get really well today against this team, and it didn't quite happen. He had some good moments, and that end of the first half was good. But he comes out of it kind of feeling like he did last week. Is it hard to get? Is it hard to get better? I mean, granted, he made mistakes, but his numbers are going to look ex exponentially worse this week than they did last week because you've got an Akron team that there's no reason why you shouldn't run the ball down their throat. You know, so there's a lot of close ones yeah. around the around the end zone. Where yeah, maybe you should be maybe you could be throwing it to, to DJ Barker, maybe you could be throwing it to uh, you know to some of your other guys, but you want to get good in the run game and you want those guys running downhill. And today was a run game deal they needed to get they needed to get some confidence in the run game they needed to get some run blocking from that o-line and that's that's how they rolled um so i am i think peyton thorne's gonna be okay um is it concerning yeah it is but at, at the same time uh you know i think over the over the span, course of the season he's probably gonna put up the same numbers if not better than he did last year and uh and it's not like we haven't seen this before i think if anytime we have really high expectations for a quarterback Things seem anytime they make a mistake, they seem uh, you know magnified. I think Washington, their people will see fifty-two nothing and like, wow, we got our hands full with this team. Then they're they're going to look at the film and they're going to be like, oh, yeah, we got a shot against these guys. Right, but that's always the case. Like you know, fifty-two like, nothing. That's not like what Georgia did against Oregon, where they just like scored every time they had the ball the first seven times they had it. No. So Michigan State, a lot to work on with a. a despite winning 52-0, to zero, which makes for an intriguing, interesting situation for a top-15 team, getting ready to go out west right after Wisconsin loses to Washington State, which does not make the Big Ten look good. Shout-out to Washington State. I've got uh, ties through my sister-in-law. Her brother works for that, for that program. as defensive line coach out there, so the entire family was out there this weekend. So shout-out to Washington State. Happy for them. Not disappointed for Wisconsin, obviously, being a Big Ten guy, but uh, got to feel good for the Cougars. Yeah. Especially Wisconsin. after losing to Central Michigan in the bowl game, right? All right. What, did we miss anything else? What else? What else? Oh, the kicker, oh, that's Jack wrong. Stone. Yeah. Uh, that was a great opportunity for him. See that, they, that, that, that's important. And the pre-snap read, I said it'd be nice if they gave him a chance to to do something. You don't want your red zone offense to fail. That you have to kick, but it was a perfect scenario. Yeah, I mean, he, it's they had no shot at getting in the end zone there. They got the ball back with 55 seconds. They went. They did everything they could. Perfect. Uh, they made one, you know, one bad play where it was like. Uh, no timeouts left, and they had a uh, tackle for loss. 
on a flare out to to uh, to join her. That was kind of a silly, weird kind of play, but the way everything transpired, they got field goal range, uh, and you know Jack Stone gets to kick a 42 yarder. I think anything over 40 is is uh, it's impressive. Uh, he had, you know, he had like last week when he kicked and he missed that one. It, it looked good in a lot of ways. He's got good leg strength and uh, pulled it a little bit. This one was high out, you know, it, was, it came off his foot really nice. Mel Tucker was really excited about it. But we've seen this in the past where if, if you're playing overmatched opponents week after week and you don't get your field goal unit yeah. out there, I think back to the John L days when, yeah. they had a chance, when they had a chance to kick field goals against Hawaii and June Jones yeah. and John L had a little personal grievance there with June Jones and the mustache. And so he decided to run it down, you know, yeah. like get those, score those touchdowns. No, you get more out of a, you get more out of Jack Stone kicking a 42 yes. yarder after missing a 44 yarder the week before. This yeah. is, that's a big development. In fact, I think, you know, you want to look at one of the top, top developments to come out of this game it's him kicking that because we've I seen agree. what a good kicker he is on kickoffs everything goes into the end zone he's got a strong leg but now he's got confidence that he can do it in the game his teammates have confidence in him and uh, as a freshman that's a big deal that's great I mean you'd rather win this game 52-0 with a field goal than 56-0 yeah, I, I would you know what I mean no question about I that. Would, no, no question at all. There was, I don't people can message, maybe they're talking about it on the message board. For some reason, it was a late arriving crowd. There was like the students were all oh, yeah, backed up, a, thousands and thousands. There was a scan, for, word is that there was a scanner, one of those ticket scanners. Uh, one of them was broken. So instead of having multiple lines for students, they had to stand in one line. And, you know, because their tickets have to, the barcode has to get scanned. And uh, so uh, one of the scanners was out of commission. So there's a lot of late arriving students. I, I thought the crowd, just the parking spaces are a lot more out, you know, in the last city. I thought, oh, this isn't going to be as good a crowd as it was in the opener. It ended up being a really good crowd. Late in the first quarter, I'd say it was close to 90% full. I'm not sure the students, all the students got in until about like late in the no, first quarter, like early was, second quarter. It was quarter. late arriving, like Wisconsin type crowd. But they, but. I mean, I've never seen the line. It was, you know, you've been to the stadium. You know where the smokestacks used to be? Students, like 20 deep, a yeah. huge, thick line that went all the way. It was visible from here. You could see how far that line well, that's went That's what on. it was, a scanner so, issue. Um, you know, I, I know Wisconsin, what they do with their noon games, which is 11 a.m. for them when they just don't show up. Well, it's all games. There, there were, I mean, the students showed up and had to wait 20 minutes to get in. Right. And... Um, feel bad for them felt bad for the team a little bit because they came out maybe expecting a full stadium but that was that that's why that was yeah. over there the way that was but it was yeah. hot there was a lot of people leaving at halftime because it was 24-0 at that time and it was hot um I feel but, good for uh feel good for Kendall Brooks I feel good for Chuck Brantley I feel good for uh you know Chester Kimbrough defensive backs played really good today Kimbrough had a sack Michigan State left their first string defense in for quite a while when they were up 52-0 there was like 12 minutes to go in the they game and they, they were still in. they were still out there first string defense um, a couple of guys also, Peyton there. Thorne, you know, took a hit when it was 45-0, with about 13 minutes to go, and he was still on the field. Yeah. Got got through it okay though. So they Thorne, like they, the defense wasn't all first stringers. They had, you know, they. I thought they were rotating guys in. Uh, the first string defense was out there when it was the entire first string defense, or just a couple of guys. With about there? 12 minutes to go in the game, they were still out there. Maybe 10 minutes to go in the game. So they they got through it all right. And uh, and by that time, Akron had went worn out, tapped out, and, and didn't have much more to offer. But Akron showed up and uh, delivered some punches in the early going and made Michigan State uh, earn a few things halfway through the game. So they, they did their part. So good it's job. It's a weird team to prepare for. You've got 44 transfers. I want to say this earlier. And I, so the team you get one week is not going to be the same team you get the next week. You know, these guys are – like you asked, like, why will you come out, like, right after interception, why you come out in man? You know, like, yeah. that's because you have 44 transfers. You have guys well, like – Well, I don't think they'd played press man-to-man -man the whole game, and they had just turned it over. Michigan State was at midfield, which is you – know, when do you like to go – when when do teams like to go deep? Right. First and 10 in between the 40s or right after a turnover. Right. And it was both of those things, and that was the first time they went press. And they, they made their play call. Then they did it again, and on the second down, they went deep, and that's when it went through Coleman's hands. But I'm like, I, I came into the game thinking that Akron would not press much, but when they did, there'd be an automatic check to go deep because I didn't think their corners were very good. And they just, like, they, like, led with their chin on that one, but the, Michigan State didn't make them pay. Went to third and ten, and Michigan State picked it up and, and went down and scored anyway, but that was kind of peculiar. So, interesting, intriguing day. Michigan State's 2-0. and They got to get better because Washington's going to be pretty tough. We'll be checking them out this week as we get ready to uh, cover that one. Anything else, Paul? No. For Paul Conerdyke, 
My name is Jim Comfort. I've been watching the VCast from Spartan Mag from Spartan Stadium, SpartanMag.com.